So very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, very good afternoon to the esteemed guests on the panel. Dr. Ken Murthy, sir, is a very renowned, acknowledged name in Indian Forest Services. He's also associated uh, with uh, the Syracuse University, an academician of repute. His areas of expertise include adaptation to climate change in rural India, forest conservation, and many more. Uh, guiding students of uh, civil services and helping them through their processes of interview and also youngsters across the country interested in forest services all the, or issues related to environment sir has always been a forefront very good friend friend of the academy thank you so much sir that you made time for us today and a very hearty welcome to you sir thank you uh, uh, i would take uh, pleasure to also welcome uh, mr yogish uh, yogish uh, is a very young guy uh, forest service officer just into service and uh, already a very good friend of many youngsters pursuing the civil services journey. Uh, the idea of forest service was still recently an option, but something that more recently students are choosing it with a lot of passion and interest. So many of you have been responsible for these ideas. So today's session would be dedicated specifically to discuss issues about the environment, forest and questions how students will be facing them in terms of the interview ahead. So over to Dr. K. Muthi sir first for the initial address and then Yogi sir will give the initial address and then we will have a question and answer session on specifics. Over to you sir. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, can I share the screen? Uh, yes sir, please sir. Ms. PPT. I'll share the host right sir. Welcome to all the hopefuls. Uh, at the outset, I wish all of you good luck. We want uh, more and more candidates from uh, Karnataka to join the forest service and do a national service. Uh, while in forest service, you are, you, are, you are at the forefront of some of the burning issues. And I'm sure uh, you are going to contribute in a big way. So uh, we are happy to, and we are very, very delighted to see that some six or seven candidates uh, are appearing for IFS interview. And it has always been my pleasure to you know interact with them and give them some basic information. I, I'm not, forest is a very vast subject. It includes scores and scores of subjects. And there are people spending whole life in on one insect or you know one 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 plant or one climber, one medicinal plant or some such thing. So I will not be able to do justice to the entire forest sector. I just I'm going to give you a small little overview of the sector so that it is helpful to you to face the interview very confidently. Should there be any questions on the forest? So I'll just I'll take you through a, a overview. First, I'll give you a global overview, and after that, I will um, bring you to the state state level issues. Um, first, let us let us go through. This, this is a presentation which I generally make for uh, uh, civil service candidates. A little bit, little bit old, a couple of years old, but you can update it always. I will give you the sources where to update. Okay, so this is a, a, a overview of the uh, forestry, uh, both at the uh, global level and also the uh, Indian level, and including the um, uh, state level also. I will give you some ideas. The first slide is the uh, world forestry. Now here it is depicting a world map and it is showing you which are all the areas where the forests are there. If you see, the forests are mainly tropical forests, particularly distributed on, on either side of the equator. That is where the tropical forests are. And tropical forests cover about 45%. You can see here on the left hand side, you can see the proportion. So tropical forests are 45% uh, of the global forest cover. And boreal forests, which are those those which are standing on the um, ice ice uh, uh, born areas, ice bearing areas, that's about twenty seven percent. Temperate forests, which are uh, in between, that's about sixteen um, percent. At least eleven percent. Now, at the global level, if you see, uh, the forests cover about thirty one percent of the global land area. This is the important measure. Uh, a few decades ago, it used to be around 36%. It has come down. And uh, a few centuries ago, it used to be somewhere close to 39-40%. Uh, uh, but it has come down drastically and it now currently it stands at 31%. So this is one important statistics. And out of this, the distribution, four broad categories, there are hundreds and hundreds of categories. But then if you uh, classify the forest at the global level, it broadly falls into these four categories and uh, the proportions are the tropical forests are the highest in terms of area and then boreal forests, uh, temperate forests and subtropical. This is the order. 
Now, if you look at which are the countries who are having the maximum forests. Now, the color coding is given and the legend is given at the bottom. If you see the Russian Federation, uh, this is an old figure which has been coming. Uh, Russian Federation is uh, uh, having the maximum amount of forest. Something like 20% of the world's forest is in Russia. Uh, and there are so many issues surrounding the forest management in Russia. There are lots of mismanagement. Uh, but still, uh, considering the number of people, the area they have, uh, the kind of utilization they are putting it to, uh, Russia still has the largest amount of forest. Then uh, next is the Brazil, 12%. Then Canada, that's about 9%. And the US, 8%. Then if you see China, uh, China is one issue where the forestry sector is growing. Other countries, it is either stagnant or it's coming down. China is one country where the forest percentage is increasing. So uh, they have separate programs. There, there used to be something called uh, green for the green. Yeah, they ran a massive campaign, world's largest program. And uh, that has really helped them to you know, plant... Uh, very large areas, world's largest operation today is in China. And after that, it is India. So they have done a lot of uh, forestation using a scheme called grain for green. So if you plant trees, people used to be given grains. So uh, Of course, that is something like two decades old program. Under that, massive amount of uh, planting has been done. Then after China, it is Australia. Then uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Indonesia. Indonesia has got some 17,000 islands and many islands are forested. There are, there are hardly any people there. So a large number of islands are there. Peru and India. So if you count India, it is at the, uh, you can see it's in 11th position. And the rest of the world has got uh, 34%. So Indian position is 11th. And uh, the one uniqueness about India's forest cover is that it is very stable. So it doesn't fluctuate. There is no uh, kind of massive deforestation or massive forest. forestation is going on, but then it's somewhat equal to what is being consumed. So uh, the net addition to the forest areas is not very huge, but then uh, it is a net addition only all the time. But this net addition we'll discuss a little later. Uh, it's more due to the tree-based horticulture. Uh, we'll discuss that later. But for the time being, remember, the India is 11th in the world and its forest cover is very stable. Uh, now, one question related to forest is that the carbon sequestration, how much carbon captured and how much carbon is utilized, how much, uh, how much carbon is stored. These are some of these issues currently which are debated all over the world. Um, incidentally, forest sector is the only sector which can sequester carbon. The releases are lesser, but there are some releases due to fires. So, if there is a bushfire in, say, Australia, or a forest fire in US, or a forest fire in China, a lot of the carbon gets released. But under normal circumstances, forest cover, forestry is one area where the sequestration is maximum. No other sector can, every other sector is a emitter. Uh, the forest sector is a net sequester worldwide. So uh, for that purpose, the forestry is always recognized as a very important component in uh, climate negotiations and climate debates. Uh, if you just look at where is all the carbon stored within the forest sector, forest sector stores approximately about uh, in the global carbon, it may be storing about roughly half, half of the global carbon stocks. So within that half, 50% of the carbon, 47 or so, uh, you can look at the IPCC reports. There they will give you uh, how the world carbon is distributed, where it is utilized, where it is uh, released, where it is sequestered. Uh, all kinds of things you can see under the IPCC sixth report is there. So on that you can see more details. But for here, it is just giving you a picture of how much carbon is stored within the forest. So if you see the living trees, whatever is the so-called uh, above ground biomass, the trees, whatever you see above the ground standing, uh, that's called above ground biomass. This has got, other if you treat Entire forest sector is 100% of the carbon stock of the uh, forest sector. Out of that, 44% is in the above ground biomass. This is in the form of trees, bushes, climbers, leaves and whatever. Then about 4% is in dead wood which is lying on the forest floor. 
and 6% is in the litter, the dry leaf which falls, particularly the coniferous leaves, they take very long time to degrade. Sometimes the peat soils are formed and sometimes you will see one meter or two meter deep soils formed out of uh, this kind of uh, semi-rotten or unrotten leaves for the forest to cover. So that contributes about 6%. 40 percent is in the forest uh, soil, organic soil matter. So this is an important cover and this should not be disturbed. This is a very, very stable thing. Whatever is above the ground, sometimes it may slightly go up or slightly come down depending upon monsoon patterns, uh, the fire, fire uh, the globe, uh, heat conditions and all that. But then the whatever is inside the soil, it's very stable and it hardly changes. So this is about 45 percent. So the, uh, this, is, this is an important pole. And those who operate in the forest area, they should uh, remember uh, that the um, soil disturbance is not a very desirable thing inside the forest areas. It should always be kept intact. Even planting also, they should not do too much because the exposed soil uh, while planting also releases carbon. And the, the, we may be unwittingly releasing more carbon uh, than we'll be sequestering by way of planting. So, that's an important item that people should. Now, so there is a concept called trees per capita. In a, in a country, if it's a green country, then uh, they will look at number of trees per person. So this is this uh, slide is giving you how many trees are there per person over the globe. So the highest number are in Canada because there are very few people and they have vast areas, uh, very very sprawling areas, they have one person has um, 8,953 trees, that many trees, so full of trees. And that's one reason. Now, that's also a lot of areas are also under snow cover in Canada. So they are very happy with the climate change. That's one country which is happy because uh, their snow peaks uh, will melt and some of those areas will become habitable. Some of the trees, trees may move up in the snow line, uh, more forest may be found and uh, uh, they may be able to put more lands to more lands to agricultural use if the temperature increases in Canada. Otherwise, most of the year, you know, some areas will be under minus temperatures. So they are not habitable and uh, there is nothing growing there, not even grass. So uh, as the global temperature increases, uh, Canada is likely to benefit and for that reason, they are very happy about climate change. Uh, so the Canadians have got the largest number of trees per person. Bolivia, 5,465. Russians have got roughly half of Canada. Central African countries, uh, African countries, uh, some, some of them are very good. The rich forests are there. They also got a good number. China and India, we are nowhere. I'm just giving you these figures. Uh, we are nowhere. The Chinese below, there are 104 trees per person. Whereas India, we got 28 trees only. That is all we have. And within the world average is 422. You remember this figure. World average, if you take uh, people or six trees, uh, there are 420 trees per person, living person. Uh, but then uh, India is, uh, you look at this where we are, and that's one reason why we should all work together, contribute in a big way, and at least take it to the somewhere closer to you know bearable or tolerable figures. So we are very, very, very low in terms of number of trees per capita. Out of this, Bangalore city. Uh, the cities are growing, uh, class 1, tier 1 cities are called, tier 1 cities are always growing. And tier 1 cities are the, the, are the places where maximum economic activity happens. So in these areas, uh, there is always very good reasons to remove trees uh, and make it uh, less green and lesser green. But that is a very bad thing because we need fresh air and uh, we also need uh, this uh, dust to be collected on the trees and some lot of, uh, the environment has to be maintained. So we need something like uh, one person needs seven to eight trees uh, in a city condition also. That is the requirement actually. Seven to eight trees per person because you need 750 kg, 40 kg of oxygen per year. So for producing this much of oxygen, you need seven to eight trees of uh, medium-sized trees, not very large, not very small. But medium-sized trees, you need 740. And uh, uh, we have uh, how much? Uh, sorry, 740 kg of oxygen we require, uh, for which you need 78 trees. But we have 0.167 trees, uh, which is uh, not even, uh, I don't know how to call this. You need 78 trees, and we have 
such a low percentage, uh, such, a, such a very low percentage, and that's why your uh, city will always be under trouble. Any city should plan and they should have 78 trees per person inside the city. Then it will be the weather conditions will be stable. The loss and gain of forests are given for three periods, uh, 1990 to 20, 2000, 2000 to 2010, 2010 to 2020. You can see the, the there is a small increase in uh, Asia. Uh, this ocean I represent is Australia and small group of countries that side. They are just there only. And nothing big or nothing less, nothing, uh, nothing very uh, great about them. European countries, slight increase, lot of their uh, farmlands are uh, left as fallows, and many people are trying to bring forest on their fallow lands. And that's why you see a slight increase, huge loss in South America and Africa. These are very poor countries, and they are selling their timber uh, for buying their essentials. So they want medicine, medical equipment, or space equipment, or military equipment. Are some advanced equipment. Uh, the only dependency is uh, to cut some forest, sell the timber, and make some uh, money and then get it. So, for this reason, the South American countries and the African countries, they have always been dependent on the natural resources. And that's why you see that there is a huge fall, negative growth of the forestry in uh, South, uh, uh, South America and African countries. They have also been demanding. One reason is that. They've been asking, okay, we protect the forest and we maintain the forest uh, for the global, you know, weather circulation, for the global, uh, you know, atmospheric maintenance and all that. But nobody compensates. There is something called global commons. So they are saying, okay, if you want us to conserve the forest, let them be treated as global, global commons and then you please compensate us for uh, whatever forest we are maintaining. So the, if that demand is met, uh, this is likely to come down, but uh, considering the demand for wood and uh, other forest products, uh, mm, the only pressure will shift to some other areas because ultimately market needs that much of material. So if you reduce the supplies from one area, demand shifts to some other area. It is simple. Now overall, mm, uh, what is the afforestation and deforestation decade-wise if you look at, or half decade-wise if you look at, uh, between 1990, annual rate of forest expansion and deforestation. So, these are the figures being given here. 1990-2000, there was deforestation of 16 million hectares, whereas afforestation was 8 million hectares. So, that gives you a net of 8. So, like that, if you see, there was a good increase between 2000 and 2010. A slight reduction, but uh, the afforestation was more. Uh, this was partly because of the Chinese Green for Green program. Subsequently, if you see, the reduction, the deforestation is reduced. Afforestation is also reduced. That doesn't help. You are reducing both. That doesn't help. We don't look kind of stabilizing the existing cover, but that's not enough. We are releasing more carbon. If you look at climate changes, the amount of carbon we are releasing and the uh, kind of vegetation we require for getting back that carbon is much more than what we have. So we are just only stabilizing whatever cover we have. We are not doing much. We have to do more. So globally important for us. Uh, Tropical forests are the most important because the maximum amount of biodiversity is there in the tropical forest. Uh, millions of uh, you know species are available in the tropical forest. Whereas if you go to uh, semi-tropical or boreal forest, the diversity comes down dramatically. Uh, it won't be even um, one-tenth of what you see in the tropical forest. So tropical forests are extremely important from that perspective of biodiversity because for every commercial crop we are cultivating today, uh, there are wild varieties, corresponding wild varieties, which were the source of these crops. So uh, if, the, if you lose them there, and uh, if the, uh, should there be any problem with our crop uh, crops, then we we'll lose the crop also, and uh, we will not be able to replace those crops. Any any important any crop for that matter is important in today's condition. You lose maize, you lose paddy, you lose wheat. Anything you lose. Globe will come uh, under very severe pressure. The whole entire entire world will come under severe pressure because every country is consuming uh, in such huge quantities that one product missing, uh, some something like 300 crops are cultivated for food. So all these things have got their wild relatives in the forest areas, and they've all been brought there and domesticated. So if there is a severe problem, either due to let's say 
virus or say bacteria or some insect pests or something, then we should have wild genes which can be brought, which can be introduced into the cultivated crops and you get back your, um, you know, commercial food crops on track. Otherwise, you lose some of them and we were about to lose paddy uh, in the mid-1990s and very early 1990s. Paddy was under severe threat. They recovered some genes from uh, wild plants and then introduced that into paddy varieties and then we were able to stabilize that. Otherwise, the disease threat of wiping, wiping out the paddy was so severe in 1990s. Amazon representing over 60% of the remaining rainforest. These are the most important. These are called water towers of the world. So these are the forests which release huge amount of humidity in the atmosphere and they control the global uh, weather circulation. So whatever uh, the global air currents are there, the humidity levels are there, rainfall is there, all that is regulatory, uh, regulated by the Amazonian forests. So they are called the global water towers. And then the forest impact local climate and regional monsoon patterns. Uh, this is there everywhere. Some hill forests will have some impact. Western Ghats will have some impact. Himalayas will have impact. Those are all there. But then at the global level, the Amazon forests are the most. Uh, so the forests, they store nearly 70% of the biodiversity. They regulate the low water, local water cycles. And incidentally, world over, all the major cities, including New York, gets their water supply directly from forests. Something like some 40 cities uh, will get their water supply directly from the forest. But the water flowing into the river is a different thing. Oh, it flows into the river, it flows certain length. Then somewhere you somebody sucks some water, somebody releases gutter into that. That's a different part of the story. I am not talking about it. I am talking about cities which are getting water directly from the forest. Somewhere some dam is done uh, where there is no habitation of any kind. From there they get the water. Pure natural water. So something like 40 cities in the world, largest cities, get their water supplies from uh, forests. And uh, uh, many other cities are looking at this option wherever there are forests available. A large number of global conventions on forestry, many, like, um, quite, a, quite a few of them. I'm just listing a few here, very important ones. So United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. This is kind of mother conference. From this, so many other things have come out. Three conventions within that UNCD there was one biological diversity based on which we have got a biological diversity conservation act in India. Also, many countries also have enacted. Then there is one on uh, combating desertification. Uh, somehow, this did not see the light of the day. Not much work was done. But this is very important for some of the African countries uh, because uh, the life of the people there will be very, very very delicate and very uh, kind of uh, it's dependent on uh, very very small kind of uh, rainfall very few crop very few animals and the desert is unfortunately spreading in some parts of the globe so if that spreads it is going to affect your uh, cultivation uh, cultivated areas commercial cultivation areas it's also going to affect a lot of cities so this this uh, convention not much work has been done, but now people are looking at the option of, uh, you know, setting up solar power plants in these deserts. So that thought is going on that uh, wherever there are very extensive deserts, can we set up solar power plants on large, very large areas and see that the power is supplied to other countries so that we don't use so much of coal or so much of uh, you know, fossil fuels for generation of the electricity. So some thought is going on on this, this is just for your information. The climate is much less, uh, but then there is a lot of talk, there are a lot of theories, and this is one thing which is going to radically transform the lifestyles. And in a couple of years from now, you may see so many electric vehicles running on the road, electric vehicles. Uh, so so, uh, so much of solar power being generated. Uh, this kind of very radical changes are coming up because of the climate change. Uh, otherwise, people were happily burning uh, coal, happily you know, using wood and uh, doing all kinds of things. Uh, but now people have become very conscious. Their uh, fossil, fuel, fossil fuel consumption is coming down. Uh, deforestation levels are also coming down. And people are trying to switch to renewables, particularly the solar energy uh, and things like that. So this one convention has kicked off in a big way, although uh, whatever has been agreed uh, to be done or to 
uh, you know, from uh, the rich countries to poor countries, whatever tra technology transfer are supposed to be done, whatever funding transfer is supposed to be done, nothing much happened. But then a uh, huge amount of awareness has been created. Then there are also many other uh, small conventions, Ramsar Convention, Wetlands, World Heritage Convention, uh, Trade in Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna, then Bond Convention of Migratory Species, then uh, WTO, ITTA, there are, there are so many of them. Some of them you can uh, see, I've given a link here. Use this link and uh, see some of those things. Uh, sometimes they become quite tricky. For example, the CITES becomes very tricky. So, under that, some of your species like red sanders cannot be exported or say sandalwood cannot be exported. So, some of them becomes uh, very constraining. Then only we realize their importance. Otherwise, we really don't care. Whatever go goes, uh, that goes, whatever comes in, comes in. But sometimes these ideas, the, the restrictions on, there are so many plants which are uh, now banned from export under the CITES. So, uh, some... So, so many animals they, they keep on you know adding to the list. There's a huge amount of restrictions, but sometimes it also affects the country's progress uh, because some of these plants which uh, can get you a lot of money are listed under societies and you will not be able to trade in those plants or animals. The key issues at the global level: deforestation. The poor countries continue to depend on the natural resources. Deforestation means a continuous problem there. Export imports of forest products. Uh, everybody, huge. Every country is importing something, exporting something. And India is importing some timber worth about some 50,000 crores a year. The slightly come down from about 30,000 crores it may be today. But uh, we are uh, we are massive importers like the Japanese fellows import, Chinese fellows import, and uh, American fellows. Everybody wants to import. I don't know. A tree cut anywhere in the globe has the same, same impact. As you cut in Africa and bring it to India. And I cut a tree in India, it's one and the same thing. From a larger perspective, the global. But somehow countries think that they will save their trees and get the trees cut from another, another country and bring wood and all that. It's going on. It's a kind of a localized issue. But uh, some countries are looking at the export of wood as one of the main channels. Like this Canadian fellow, they've been all over the world. They want to cut their forests and sell the forest produce. Uh, Russians are also doing the same thing. Whosoever uh, has, is having massive, massive forests. They want to capitalize those forests. So one way to capitalize is that uh, they cut and sell the forests. Earlier they used to cut and sell the logs. Huge logs, massive logs used to come. One lorry will can take only two logs. It used to be some six meters in girth, four meters in girth and like that. Now you don't see any of these things. So uh, all those massive trees have been cut down already. Some 300 years old, 400 years old trees have already been finished. Now we have some smaller size trees. Uh, a lot of plantation timber is also coming. Countries are slowly moving towards, instead of exporting round timber, they are trying to export some something called scantlings, which are rough dressed, squared logs. Uh, you know, so that at least reduces, you know, transporting some waste wood to other countries. So initially they started sending dressed logs. Then subsequently they thought, uh, why, why were dressed logs even converted to further, uh, you know, products, value, value added products. Then some countries started selling planks. Some countries started selling tiles. Some countries started telling, uh, selling manufactured furniture. So now, uh, slowly, all countries have turned. That those, these kind of activities create domestic employment. Otherwise, if you cut a tree and simply export it, so you only get the minimal value. There may be some small labor involved and some transportation involved, but there won't be net uh, employment in the country. Uh, the employment gets created if you have huge industries manufacturing a variety of uh, furniture-based products and then exporting them. Uh, India also has got some hubs which manufacture, where the thousands of manufacturing units are there, furniture manufacturing units, units are there. I was last time in Jodhpur, there's one such hub. There are also many such hubs. There are thousands of factories will be there. They will be manufacturing uh, wooden furniture. They will be exporting. Uh, this thing has become a very interesting stuff. While we import huge quantity of uh, uh, logs, we export some small quantity of uh, furniture, but our target is that we stop the import, but export huge amount of uh, manufactured furniture, because that can uh, create add value to your uh, trees 
and also create huge employment and get new get a foreign exchange. So some work is going on on exporting of furniture in the country, preventing desertification. This is one area. Rajasthan used to be our uh, huge desert, and of course, Leh Ladakh is our second uh, coal desert. Leh Ladakh, not much afforestation is going on, but Rajasthan, uh, massive amount of afforestation has been done, and uh, you hardly see any desert these days. Biodiversity conservation. This is one work everywhere, all over the country is going on. Then carbon sequestration, watershed protection, protecting the rights of aborigines. This is one topic where India also has enacted Forest Rights Act. We are given a lot of land to uh, tribal people. It was initially the thought for for tribal, but subsequently other communities also have been added. Uh, then it it has opened a Pandora's box and it has become a mess. Uh, but some other countries. It's only limited to aborigines, like particularly in Africa, Australia, uh, Canada, U.S. The Red Indians and the, the native, uh, you know, Negroids. They are trying to establish their rights, and they are going to International Court of Justice and many other places, and trying to establish their rights over the entire land. And some of them are successful. So wherever they are successful, the national governments or state governments are forced to, uh, you know, negotiate a deal. With the aborigines who originally owned the land, forest land, and then uh, they are trying to, you know, give them some royalty from the tourism revenue, some royalty from the timber revenue, some royalty from mining revenue, uh, so that these aborigines are also, uh, you know, kept happy. Otherwise, the aborigines were all the time being exploited as only labor laborers. Uh, that situation is changing, and more and more countries are recognizing the rights of aborigines. This red plus is uh, reduction of emissions from uh, deforestation degradation. There is also a plus to that, but this is not very important these days. Biodiversity hotspots, uh, trade in forest products, particularly non-timber forest products and uh, wildlife uh, products are products of dead animals. So this is one because a lot of uh, animals are traded across the. Uh, this is all clandestine. If you look at the COVID thing, also people started complaining that these things have come up uh, mainly because the animals, wild animals. Uh, bats and other things they have been uh, exploited and uh, the virus went through mutations and uh, they, they became kind of somewhat uncontrollable so the trade in the wildlife products uh, and the dead animals including tigers the panthers uh, pangolins snakes uh, a large number of products a huge number uh, there is one uh, uh, traffic india and traffic international and all that there are separate and exclusive organizations who work very closely with the customs department and uh, keep a watch on these kind of illegal things they suddenly flare up maybe most of them may be going on but sometimes if there is some kind of a, you know leakage somewhere in both the information then suddenly somebody probes and you will see that there is a large underground sector operating in the animal product and they are you know importing and exporting in big number so that's all about the global things now coming to india this is the india map showing uh, the forest cover, you can broadly see that the Northeast has got uh, rich forests. So, you know, seven sisters, they have got very good forests. But the interesting part of the Northeastern forest is that 95% uh, of the Northeastern forests are privately owned. There is very little forest owned by the government. Whereas in other parts of India, all other parts of India, 95% of the forest is owned by government and some 2 3 percent may be owned by private forests. Uh, that's the principal difference between Northeast and rest of the Indian states. Uh, if you see, then uh, you will see very broadly, there are only two, three areas where the forest is concentrated in the mainland part of the um, India. One is the Western Ghats. This is long, something like 1,600 kilometers along the western border. It plays a very important uh, role in uh, you know the climate control, particularly during monsoon season. So this portion gets the very, very good rainfall. And it is one 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 uh, important thing. That's why the forests of Western Ghats are highly valued. And you keep on listening to Kasturi Rangan report, Madhavi Gadigal's report, this report, that report. Uh, you have to somehow conserve these forests, but there are too many people also. It is densely populated. So you cannot approve people. But then at the same time, you have uh, a need to protect these forests also. Because it covers whole of Deccan area gets the benefit from these Western Ghats. Then there is one central and Indian portion which covers the Chhattisgarh portion, Madhya Pradesh, Varissa and uh, Jharkhand portion. Uh, these are also important tribal belt. These are the large number of uh, origins are here. 
excellent forests are there, but only one thing is these are deciduous forests. Um, that's why you see the cover yellow there. So these are deciduous forests, very important. All high value products come from deciduous forests. Your teak, your rosewood, your sandalwood and things like that come from deciduous forests. So that's why these forests are very important. And um, because their tribal population is very high, the mineral content in the soil is very high. They are also important sources of water for uh, these, uh, so many states surrounding the, the, these forests. So uh, huge values attached to the forest in the Vindhyan region. There are also good forests along the Tarai Belt. If you see the Jammu Kashmir portion, Himachal portion, and Uttarakhand portion, some portions of that, uh, some forest is there. These forests are also very important. Now, these days we are hearing about landslides in uh, so many you know, Himalayan regions. People are going there, building too many dams. The soil is very fragile. These are very young mountains. These mountains don't have stability. The, uh, if you go deep inside the Himalayas, you will see still soil is, Himalayas are still raising, they are growing in their height at the rate of some 4 centimeters per year. So the continental movement shift uh, is still happening. And uh, as the Indian subcontinent moves towards north and hits the Eurasian continent, uh, the, the uh, ground level is raised. And then that is the reason for formation of Himalayas. These soils are very, this, this, uh, this region geology is very young and very unstable and people are trying to make tunnels, people are trying to build dams uh, and that's one reason why the geology in this region is very, very unstable and you see this Badrinath uh, 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 Joshi Mutt, so the whole town was vacated and this is one uh, fertile region for more vacations because uh, wittingly or unwittingly the central government wanted to build lot of dams, because there is a lot of height gradient is available. You can build hydroelectric dams, too many of them, both in the northeast and also in the Himalayan region and get power from the hydroelectric dams and a large number of run of the river. They are called straight, they don't build big dams, but then you divert water from a running river and take them to a place where there is a fall, so a sudden fall, there you generate electricity. But then it's all, all about playing with the nature. You are going to divert water, then get it back again at a place where there is a huge uh, drop uh, and this disturbs the soil. So you have to build power plants, transmission lines, make the roads and a lot of people will be there, a lot of activity will be there, it will be disturbing the forest. So a lot of uh, halagula is happening in the Tarai belt of the Himalayas. Uh, and deep inside if you go, then there are the Chinese borders and they are the defense related issues. And again, they are, they are building a huge infrastructure, border roads, uh, you know, aerodromes, uh, installation of uh, defense installations. So all that is going on. There are a lot of disturbance in Himalayas. That's one reason why, um, you know, some people are getting disturbed about the ecology in this region. So this is a broad distribution. Uh, if you want to know more about the forest in India, Forest Survey of India publishes every two years, there is something called uh, state of Forest in India. They publish it. It is available on their website. I have given a link here. So you can open up. Reports are available from 1987 to, to date. You don't have to read every report because every two years there is a report. There are so many reports. We just read uh, one or two in the middle and the latest one. That, will, that should be fair enough. So within India, the forest cover is dense, very dense forest. Uh, very dense forest is just 23%. Overall, we have something like 21.67%. This is 2019 data. 2021 data also has come. This data is um, just get a, just give, to give you an idea. Every two years, the Forest Survey of India, based on the previous two years of images, so which means there is a gap of four years uh, between the data points and the interpretation and publication of the report. There will be a gap of four years. Thus, uh, uh, the Forest Survey of India takes uh, samples all over the country. That sampling work itself takes about two years. But uh, remote sensing images they would have taken from the previous years. Now, of course, uh, they can get better images and very quick images, immediate images also. But then it is at least two years old, the data, whatever is published. So, 19 means this was based on 2017 data. Today's 2021 means it is 19 data. So based on this, we have something like 22 forests to 20% forest cover in the country. Uh, of this, very dense forests are 
moderately dense forest 9% and open forests are 9.26%. And uh, there is something called tree cover. Tree cover is just outside the forest. It could be your areca gardens, it could be your coconut gardens, it could be orchards, it could be trees, it could be some hills, it could be roadside, roadside trees, it could be urban forests, urban uh, you know, parks. All of that included is coming to something like 2.89%. So the overall, if you include all of that, you will reach a figure of something like 24.56%. And this is, uh, this is not enough. We should be having one third because the global level also, that's 31%. It, it came down from 36. So the ideal kind of uh, uh, tree cover we should be having, both at the global level and also at the national level, is somewhere around 34, 33 to 35, 36. That's the ideal percentage. But we are far away from that. But one problem is that we will not be able to expand the tree cover because the reserve forest boundaries are defined. The rest of the land area, the land area is occupied for one or the other purpose. Uh, something for town, something for culture cultivation something for projects, something for rivers, something for dams. So there is no other area which is free from a kind of human usage. And therefore, you will not be able to stretch this forest from this 21%. So whatever happens has to happen outside only, agri agroforestry. And that's why government of India is giving a lot of uh, emphasis in agroforestry because you can put more trees on the farmlands uh, and the forest land left to itself will recover and uh, it will become greener and better. So the policy is now somewhat polarizing on these ideas that you leave the natural forest undisturbed and whatever you want to produce, produce it on the farmlands like all other things we produce. No, anything we want to eat or any, any products we want to have, natural products, we are dependent on the farmlands. So we are for forestry purpose also for the industries, wood-based industries, we are now shifting towards uh, uh, the farmlands. So today, uh, almost... 60-65% of the timber required for uh, human consumption is coming from foreign lands, about 65%. About 30% we are importing and about 5%, 5 to 7% are, uh, is coming from forests. Earlier it used to be rivers. 60, more than 50% used to come from forests and uh, uh, farmlands used to contribute some small percentage. But now it is completely reversed. Agroforestry is number one in supplying the market needs, something like 65%. And about 30-35% we are still importing. This is what is to be bridged. So we have to expand the agroforestry by another 50% um, or so. Then we'll be able to meet all our uh, wood requirements. So this is the overview. Out of this, there is something called scrub forest. It's a small percentage. But this scrub forest is attracting attention these days. Because people think that scrub is a wasteland. It is not really true. Scrub has its own role. And some of these animals can only live like uh, there is some bird called great Indian bustard. It can live only on a grassland. If you offer us that, that bird cannot live. Already it is endangered. Very few animals have, uh, very few birds are there. Just a few, come, maybe some 300, 350 or less than 400. So partly in Andhra, some place called Rollapadu. Uh, in Karnataka, it is there in Rane Bennur. In Gujarat, some portions it is there. So we will be, you know, uh, snuffing out all these kind of um, animals, which uh, can only live in a scrub forest. So some uh, pangolin can live in a scrub forest. Huge amount of termites live in a scrub forest. Huge amount of ants live in a scrub forest. Uh, a lot of grass varieties live in a scrub forest. In a thick forest, if you go, there won't be any grass. So whatever grasses are there, they are only in the scrub forest. Like that, no forest is useless. Some people may think, what is there? It's a scrub jungle. But uh, it's not valueless. It has its own importance. Even if there is a scrub, uh, some bouldery, rocky hills, no vegetation, it is still uh, the you know habitat for uh, black bears uh, or say some hyenas or so, some wolves. They will only live in that kind of situation. They cannot live in a regular forest or uh, in some other area. So we should also keep the requirement of such animals in mind. Whenever uh, you know, we think of uh, greening some, some of these areas, <laughs> blindly planting in all the open areas is also not a, not a great idea. This should not be done. We can plant in an urban area, in open forest, in a you know, civic community site, um, or some areas uh, which have been, um, you, know, you know, no more required as farmlands or something like that, or along a river course we can plant. So there are areas where planting has definite advantages. But there are areas 
even though they are looking very open very scrub like very useless but they have their own value intrinsic value that's called oh, we should not uh, disturb them now in terms of uh, states and largest forest areas uh, this is this table gives you some figure andaman highest forest sikkim manipur uttarakhand himachal pradesh arunachal tripura and that karnataka i am just giving you for the purpose of reference only because some of you might be there in karnataka pondicherry is the lowest 2.65% that is only hardly in the city, only city portion of it so it has got the lowest forest in the area. but it is a union territory isn't it? and it has got the lowest forest just just a overview of the forest administration uh mainland 98% of the forests in india are owned by government uh then forest department in india was created by uh the british government in 1864 so uh, uh, the founder was a german this is very interesting the british fellows conquered india but they didn't know much about uh, the forest administration forest management for most important positions germans were the best they were the best administrators they had the best knowledge they had the best management capabilities the british fellows were also kind of criminals they were only you know defeating people conniving people uh, creating differences between two people and kind of winning the colonies but the real administration was done by the uh, german experts and uh, forest department is one such typical case the first forester in india was called his name was brandis and he was a german he founded the forest department in india this is one of the most stable department those days there were only two three departments one was pwd one was revenue and one was forest so that was the kind of importance forest had in those days but now of course forest is nowhere forest is a concurrent subject under the constitution uh, it has become concurrent only in 1976 prior to that it was a state subject the government of india lays down broad policy under the current situation because it is under concurrent subject list uh the uh, government of india now provides only policy framework uh provides some legislation like wildlife legislation or like uh, you know forest rights act and all that direction training and research facilities are created and some small amount of funding to the states by and large states manage the forest areas and the largest number of uh, staff are paid by the state governments the land belongs to the state the officers and uh, staff are employed by the state government and this is a, a property of the state government basically the central government only has got a, a supervisory or oversight kind of uh, right and uh, they cannot uh, you know dictate beyond it certain level fortunately or unfortunately supreme court and the state high courts take a lot of interest in forest matters uh, because uh, the trees and the animals don't have a uh, you know voting right so wherever there is voting right these politicians are very active and uh, they will go to any extent to please their uh, you know subjects and they want votes but unfortunately these poor things the trees and the animals cannot speak they don't have votes and therefore they are silently finished off and for that reason the high courts and supreme courts which are a kind of um, uh, law making courts in the country they come to the rescue of forest sector uh, most of the time uh, the day to day forest administration is the state governments and then it it's of course protected locally also by the state uh, high courts and also the supreme court there are many acts which uh, directly or indirectly govern the forest but the direct things are only four indian forest act and uh, many states they have got their karnataka for example has got karnataka forest act so wherever there is a state act the state act prevails uh, we don't care for indian forest act where there is no state act no indian forest act while the protection act is government of india forest conservation act is government of india forest rights act is government of india so uh, these last three are common for the entire country but rules for uh, under wildlife protection act have been made by some st- some states and forest rights act also so many times what happens is on a concurrent subject government of india frames the act and the states are allowed to states are given model rules and they will have some certain degree of freedom to you know change the rules according to their local requirements and they frame the rules but the broad framework something called model rules will be so circulated and they have to make some minor changes to that and adopt it so that is the case in respect of uh, forest rights act and wildlife protection act but in due course what happens is government of india will be india will be making so many changes uh, and so frequently that this uh, state rules they really become irrelevant finally we are left with only the central rules although technically speaking both have equal rights to 
legislate and uh, you know new directions so that's all about the national forestry uh, coming to forests in karnataka now here is the forest map and uh, these forests again are concentrated only around the western ghats there are some nine districts the western ghats are for uh, in karnataka starts from chamrajnagar chamrajnagar interestingly is also area where eastern ghats and western ghats meet uh, but we count it towards mostly towards western ghat because larger part is in western ghats so nine districts uh, have come under western ghats uh, chamrajnagar mysore kodagu dakshin kannada hasan chikmagalur udupi shimoga uttar kannada and belgaum Uh, there are also two districts which are just bordering. One is Dharwad, one is Bangalore. Bangalore, the Banagata portion of it is also a part of Western Ghats. But none of us recognize it because it is so close to the city and so far away from the main uh, Western Ghats. We don't recognize it, but technically speaking, it's a part of the Western Ghats. Forest cover in Karnataka, again, I'm sharing the 2019 report only. You please have a look at, uh, before you appear for Viva, you please go through Forest Survey of India report. State of Forest 2021. From that you pick up. I am just sharing the old slide only. Uh, here are the forests, very dense forests. Again, it kind of reflects the national scenario. A very dense forest, 2.3 percent, and these are mostly in Uttar Kannada and uh, Madikeri. Uh, some portions of Mangalu and Udupi. And three, four districts have got uh, very dense forests. Portion of Shimoga also has got very good uh, forests. Uh, medium dense forests, uh, 10.97 percent. Open forest, uh, 6.79 percent. Scrub forest is 2.34 percent. This is the kind of distribution of a forest in Karnataka uh, state. Now, in terms of green cover, there is a slight difference between forest cover and green cover. The forest cover includes uh, only the forest areas which are you know notified under the gazette, and they are the reserve forest. That is the only forest cover portion. But the green cover portion could be. Anything which is under permanent green cover, for example, if you have large coffee estates or tea gardens, they also come under green cover. Or if you have coconut gardens extensively in semi-mallard areas, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers uh, length, you will have coconut gardens. So they will all come under green cover. Uh, green cover could also cover uh, mango orchards in Kolar district, for example, uh, or uh, a large part of uh, tree-based orchards in some of these northern Karnataka districts. Where the pomegranate is cultivated, or uh, some other crops, tree-based crops are cultivated. So all that is included in the green cover. If you take green cover, Kodagu is on top because of the coffee. A very very little area will be open in Kodagu. Eighty percent of the area is covered. The rest of it is uh, kind of um, urban areas, or uh, dams and things like that. Uh, Uttar Kannada has got eighty percent. UDP sixty-three. Dakshin Kannada sixty-three. Uh, Chikkamangalu, fifty-four, Shivamogga, Chamrajnagar, and the lowest, lowest is Bijapur, point two four. Nowhere, Bijapur also had great forests, but uh, unfortunately, during the um, uh, Sultan's regimes, the lands were distributed very freely, uh, and a lot of it was cut, cut and used for railways. Earlier, railways used to run on firewood, so during these days, they formed something called Maratha Railways. Maratha Railway. Uh, those days, they were cutting extensive forest areas and using it for steam generation. The trains, yeah, very early trains. Subsequently, they shifted to coal, then they shifted to diesel. Now they are running on electricity. So uh, those days, these Bijapur forests were all decimated, and there is virtually no forest left. There we namesake we have some small patch. Otherwise, there is no forest in Bijapur district. Bangalore urban is also even better. It has got something like some twelve thirteen percent of forest is there. Uh, the Bangalore city, as such, uh, because of its old layout and some portions being permanently earmarked for gardens uh, and avenue trees, that gives some greenery. Of course, extension cities uh, are too crowded and they don't have much space for planting. Uh, but the old areas have got some good green parks. The protected areas, wildlife areas, protected areas includes the tiger reserves. Are the national parks, sanctuaries? There are conservation reserves, communities. There are four or five categories. Uh, so you should uh, take a good look at the categories of the protected areas. Not that other areas are protected. Somehow these areas are given extraordinary protection, and uh, all the things there are protected. For that reason, these areas are called protected areas. 
So in Karnataka, there are nationally also you should take a look at what is the uh, national statistics about the protected area. There are large numbers. So we have been adding continuously over the years. And that is giving you a, a good um, you know, kind of, you know, this uh, um, what is called the um, Cheetah's introduction into Madhya Pradesh. So such kind of programs sometimes um, they are creating uh, uh, new landmarks both in terms of history and in terms of that uh, local areas. Uh, um, continuously, all the states have been adding the protected areas for one or the other reasons. The idea being that whatever rare life forms are there, they deserve to be protected. Uh, every life on earth has got the same right to exist, just as we have. So whether it is even a small you know, beetle, that also right. Honeybee has the right to do, exist. A white ant has a right to exist, a fish has a right to exist, a frog has a right to exist. So this is being recognized and for that reason, uh, the forest sector puts in a lot of efforts. Half of their efforts are into protection of protected areas. Uh, a large number of protected, last year Karnataka also added some 3-4, you can see the list on their website. So every state is continuously adding. At the national level, we are crossed to something like 800 protected areas. But in Karnataka, I am giving you these statistics. Tiger Reserve, there are five. National Parks, two. Sanctuaries, 33. Conservation Reserves, 14. And Community Reserve is one. Uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, understanding that at least 5% of the total geographical area, 33% of the geographical area is supposed to be under tree cover. And out of that, 5% is supposed to be preserved for the uh, protected area purpose. But um, uh, it should go up to 10%. The protected area should go up to 10%. Roughly about one-third of one-third. That should be the protected area. One-third of total geographical area should be the uh, green cover. Of that, one-third should be reserved for the animals and plants and rare, rare flora and fauna. But we are expanding in this direction, but the growth is very slow. But definitely there is some problems. Important issues. Forest Rights Act. This is a never-ending act uh, because the people are still going to forest areas encroaching some pieces of land, parcels of land and then claiming that they have been there for 10 decades, 5 decades, something like that. It's all faltu. But then there is no sunset clause in this Forest Rights Act. So, so uh, it has become a permanent uh, uh, problem. People are encroaching on a, on a routine, uh, uh, routine basis. Human animal conflicts, particularly these three, four categories. Panthers have become a menace. Panther count is done in Karnataka, something like 3,000 panthers all over. You see this in the news also. That panthers are encroaching everywhere. They are into villages, they are into towns, they are into cities, and they are everywhere. And uh, this has become a problem. Fortunately or unfortunately, we don't have the monkey problem, but certain states uh, like Himachal Pradesh are facing monkey problem. There are orchards. The apple orchards are raided by monkeys, armies of monkeys. JNK is facing problem. So, some states are facing the monkey problem, some states are facing the panther problem, and many, uh, some states are facing the elephant problem because they are spilling out into open areas and causing uh, destruction of uh, property, lives, and crops. So, these are two, three major problems uh, one, the monkey problem, panther problem, elephant problem. The other animals are manageable, it's not such a big problem. So, these three you should go prepared. There could be some questions on this that uh, how do you manage this problem? Sometimes uh, the black buck is also a problem, but they're all local uh, because they're, uh, <clears throat> you know, hunters, panthers uh, can eat some of them, but then the uh, deer and uh, uh, these antlers, they multiply in such a big number, big way that the panthers also cannot keep them under control. So for that reason, in some portions of the state, uh, we are seeing the damage by spotted deer and also uh, black buck. Uh, but this is a localized problem. It may not be there all over the state. But the panthers is all over the state. Problem, it is, uh, it's a problem everywhere. Elephants are a problem in southern southern Karnataka. Now, luckily, we don't have much uh, problem with monkeys. But some states do have that problem. Land records and encroachment, land records are not updated. Because land records, uh, the onus of keeping them updated is vested with the revenue department. Our department is given kind of possession only and uh, the uh, the responsibility to protect it. So whenever there is a dispute, the revenue fellows uh, will come up with some uh, record saying that this is not even the forest land. 
So then the whole problem opens up. Diversion of forest land for government projects. There are so many national uh, highways going on. There are so many other important projects going on. Industrial corridors are going on. Uh, so the country is on the development mode. And uh, invariably, uh, either you take transmission lines or you take the river canals because we are building a huge network of canals. Uh, we are also building highways. So all of them cut through the forest and they really dismember the forest. If you cut through a forest, it is gone because the, then it becomes a two portions and then the animals cannot move freely. The, the, uh, uh, all kinds of interferences will be there, disturbances will be there. So the dismemberment is a very uh, big problem for the forest areas. If you take one canal, that's a problem. If you take one uh, railway line, it's a problem. If you take So this kind of lean, they are all called linear projects. The linear projects create a huge problem for forest. If you are submerging some forest, you lose best forest. That's also a problem. So whenever submersion happens, it's happening in the uh, thickest part of the forest. It is the valley forest that is lost. Mining is another problem. So these are all problems in forest areas. We are left with very little forest, but unfortunately or fortunately, the best part of the minerals are under the forest bed. So if you want to dig out some mineral, you have to disturb the forest, including our Bellari, Sandor. It's whatever little forests are there in this entire belt of the uh, northern Karnataka. Uh, we have uh, the best uh, mine, uh, iron ore mines, only in Bellaria, and that is directly under forest cover. So, sometimes we also make sacrifices. Western Ghats, a policy decision was taken that no mining will be allowed, and uh, we don't do any mining in Western Ghats anymore. Earlier, there used to be very big mines, and some bigger, biggest mines were closed. So, that was national loss, but in the interest of uh, you know, ecology and environment, the best companies, something like Kudrimuk, were also closed. Giant forest management, ecotourism, eco sensitive zones around protected areas, world heritage sites. These are things, certain things which you can just have a quick look and then uh, just get some idea and then go for it. There are also some miscellaneous issues which would come up in your uh, uh, interviews. One is that sometimes they could ask you about national bird, national animal, uh, state animal, state bird, and sometimes they also declare state, uh, you know, uh, butterfly. Uh, some fancy ideas will come. So some people will declare state butterfly. Uh, so uh, just uh, those of you uh, are from Karnataka to take care of these things. But other states may have different. Uh, I have given some list here. But this is not applicable for all the states. I am given only for Karnataka state. Uh, candidates from other states, please take care. Uh, what is the state animal, state bird, state tree, uh, your state. Then these two, three reports, sir. Kasturi Rangan report, Gadgil's report, uh, what are their implications, why people are opposed, what is the current status is what uh, uh, going through. Then uh, there is uh, some issues about sandalwood, bamboo, uh, forest forestation, Godavarman case. Uh, then well, uh, some small, these are, these are all relevant issues. Uh, then mining issues, these are some of the issues. One one more gets added to this. These days, the sea pollution and river pollution, they are adding in a big way. That is also a good topic for the interview. So, so, so I stop here. And if you have any questions, I have given some important links. Links which also you can go through. This will be very important information. Uh, basic information. Because you are not at forest officers. You are not expected to have a very deep understanding and knowledge about forest. You are supposed to take a test and then uh, answer some of the basic questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I stop here. Thank you, sir. Yogi, sir, we'll uh, take a quick run through the yes, yes. Uh, side, and uh, am open up the session for questions. Am I audible to you now? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Actually, sir has elaborately covered uh, all the wide-ranging issues related to forests, sir. Uh, not only with respect to our country, but also with our state as well as uh, global scenario. Uh, so now I would like to, because uh, there is not much uh, left for me to cover uh, regarding forest-related issues. Anyway, uh, like uh, being the recent recruit uh, into Indian Forest Service, uh, even that was being covered by sir like the fancy questions that might appear, I mean, that might come in your uh, personality test. Uh, hopefully, I'm, am I audible, right? 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Like other than that, uh, so what other issues that can come up uh, in your interview? Like, uh, uh, I have not prepared any uh, slides for this. Uh, like, uh, the generally, uh, so when we go to interview, they will not expect you to be a very uh, expert uh, with respect to forest-related issues, be it uh, forest-related loss or uh, any other, like maybe genetical thing uh, or like the kind of research uh, that could have happened. If you are very well aware of those things, definitely it will uh, uh, it will fetch you very good marks uh, in interview. Other than that, they might ask you very simple questions like uh, wherever you have come from, like a particular state. They might ask you a particular city. What are the general forest uh, trees you have seen? Like for example, uh, if you have come from Bangalore, they might just generally ask you which trees you have seen. Have you visited the uh, Kabban Park? Have you visited uh, Lal Bagh? What trees you have seen there? Like that, they will ask you. So just to get, I mean, be prepared for that. And uh, and they will ask you also, like, uh, have you visited any protected area? Protected area, like, uh, it, whether it, it is a national park or a wildlife sanctuary or a conservation reserve. So just uh, if you have gone there, they might ask you some uh, uh, supplementary questions, uh, like, uh, uh, what did you like the most there? Or, uh, what observation could you make there? Like that, for example, if you have visited Bandipur National Park or uh, Nagarwale National Park, they might ask you related to forest fires or uh, invasive species like lantana and other things. So just uh, I'm telling you again, you you at this point of time, if you have a better, I mean like a simple idea about uh, this thing, it is uh, more than sufficient. And one more thing uh, that uh, question that keep coming up uh, very often is uh, your graduation. Like uh, most of the because these days, a uh, lot of uh, engineers are uh, appearing in the personality test. Uh, and uh, every year, since last four or five years, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the selected candidates uh, invariably belong to uh, technical, uh, I mean, they have uh, graduated from technical stream, like engineering. So they might ask you how your graduation uh, will help you in uh, better management of uh, forests and wildlife. Like, for example, uh, for me, it was uh, electronics and communication engineering. I'm also an engineering engineer. Uh, so the very first question was, uh, how would you apply your uh, uh, like engineering knowledge? In, because uh, as of now, satellite technology is being widely used in uh, management of forests. You have seen like Forest Survey of India. Uh, it's uh, forest cover mapping. It is mainly done through satellite based uh, survey. Uh, so like that. Uh, uh, the, you can go through Karnataka, you, you just uh, google it, uh, uh, aranya.karnataka or uh, Karnataka Forest Department. There are uh, various e-initiatives uh, that are being taken up uh, by the Karnataka Forest Department. Also, there are uh, some e-initiatives that are uh, in, uh, like brought out by government of India and there are some issues which are done in collaborating, collaboration between both the central government as well as the state government. So you just go through them, you just Google them and it will give you the just introductory part of what it is. Like for example, Karnataka, they are presently doing GSFIS, it is a Geospatial Forest Information System. It is one of the very good initiative. Like that, it is just one example. So just please visit aranya.karnataka.gov. You will get some sufficient information. So very, uh, like that. Uh, like in management of forest fires uh, or wildlife, they have, they have actually recently, I think if you are reading uh, newspaper regularly, so they have, they have been deploying different types of uh, cameras uh, to like uh, find out uh, this evasive uh, leopards. And uh, yesterday there was some news that uh, thermal drones are being used to uh, manage or detect forest fires in that Bandipur, like that. Uh, whatever the technical knowledge uh, that you have studied in your engineering or uh, other streams, you just uh, have some fair idea about it. And uh, Sarah has mentioned uh, MAC issues, I mean man-animal conflict issues have become a uh, highly debated and uh, discussed topic uh, these days and uh, you please uh, pay attention to this thing and they will ask you what would be the solution mm, because you are going to administer uh, wildlife areas or territorial forests. Uh, so generally, like uh, kind of mitigation measures uh, you should focus, like for example, there can be uh, incentives to farmers with regard to leopard management or uh, uh, elephant issue management because uh, this Mysore area or wherever the leopard issue, 
uh, keeps happening uh, they have been growing uh, sugarcane in their fields uh, near to forest fringes uh, so it is a very good uh, hiding ground for uh, this uh, big cat so if they are incentivized to go for other type of crops uh, so that might also help and uh, regarding uh, capturing them and uh, uh, like whether it is like some sort of uh, some new measures like uh, sterilization of uh, uh, because to control their population because most of the protected areas in karnataka are in any other case in general at this point of time because uh, their carrying capacity is also like uh, uh, overflowing animal population has also increased substantially and uh, protected areas are uh, getting degraded on one way because of invasive species or forest fires uh, or uh, this climate phenomenon or uh, uh, because there is a um, breaking up of the protected area network so you just have a look at it i hope you go, you people have already uh, studied for your uh, civil service mains and you have been like uh, researching regarding that and conservation versus development is a common question and uh, you have better prepared here i will tell you one thing uh, in today's scenario uh, to tackle uh, uh, poverty or unemployment uh, so development is necessary and uh, so our we foresters will always have that uh, mindset that uh, we should always conserve forests uh, trees uh, that is our core uh, uh, virtue as well as uh, core uh, uh, ideal Uh, so at the same time conservation how it can be uh, like uh, how there can be harmony between conservation and uh, development so regarding western ghats you can always tell that uh, there is a huge scope for uh, ecotourism and uh, this uh, horticulture or uh, uh, sort of uh, this uh, uh, this nature eco friendly farming zero budget farming something like that you should develop anyway that's the general answer and wherever uh, there is a national imperative that we cannot uh, ignore and uh, we should uh, implement those projects uh, with such a mindset that it should cause minimum harm to the nature why we need implementation in farm uh, because uh, when ideas are conceived uh, so we can implement it in several way for example if there is a drinking water project and there is a dependency i mean people are dependent uh, on those projects for their drinking water needs when i was working in uh karwar area uh, so there was one small proposal just just a diversion of uh, just a few 5 meter by 5 meter area uh, for uh, i mean constructing one overhead uh, tank that too on the fringe of forest so in those areas forest department itself should help because uh, forest department uh, personnel are always seen in bad light uh, by either politicians also public also because our mandate is that we cannot easily say that no i mean we cannot easily say that yes come to forest area and do anything nothing like that so we should always say no no first depending upon its utility and we should support uh, in getting the formal uh, approval for it and one more thing is your optional subject optional subject uh, these interview panel members generally ask uh, for example if your optional is geology and you have come from a particular area of the country uh, for example karnataka they might ask you like uh, you tell uh, about the uh, rock formations of uh, karnataka or uh, like geology of karnataka in general like that they may ask mm. and uh, you uh, re- the recent report uh, mm, with respect to indian uh, state of forest uh, is 21 uh, so as of now 23 is not released if it is released do you i i advise you to go through uh, that and one more thing is godavarman case sir has already discussed about godavarman case it is godavarman case was uh, just like earlier there was a forest conservation act uh, but it was not known uh, uh, like it was not so popular after godavarman case only forest conservation act uh, got its uh, real uh, 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 value or uh, real weightage so irrespective of the ownership of the land whether it is a government land or, or it belongs to private person so it invariably applicable uh, to convert it for non forestry purpose so and also there is a concept of deemed forest that came out of uh, god overman case so please go through it and uh, then generally uh, because uh, i i hope most of the aspirants uh, Uh, reside in urban areas and uh, urban uh, forest uh, urban green cover is uh, shrinking due to tree felling they went ask you if you are uh, a forest officer in uh, urban area how do you increase the, the forest cover or green cover in urban areas because uh, as sir said rightly murthy sir 
there is a issue of uh, like uh, land uh, all land all, all land like other than forest department if it is owned by department uh, revenue department it is used for other purpose or granting it to people because of uh, political reasons uh, so there uh, we have to make use of uh, land that is being uh, available with the other government uh, or psus or uh, universities avenue plantation and uh, there is a recently karnataka government has uh, uh, brought one project called uh, uh, tree parks uh, so you can just uh, focus much on tree parks what what are the what are they and uh, how it is useful so i advise uh, my i mean aspirants to just uh, get little be- uh, more information regarding tree parks you will have enough content in online so that is there uh, issues related to western ghats sir has already uh, discussed a lot one issue that was uh, i think sir did not mention much about is uh, forest management uh, with the people's participation uh, joint forest management uh, in that uh, there are good examples uh, with respect to this village for village forest committees uh, or uh, in uh, some areas uh, eco development committees generally eco development committees uh, in national parks are uh, protected areas and uh, in territorial forest generally vfcs are there you, you the, for that also you have a lot of information online you be prepared uh, on those topics so uh, these are the general topics other than that uh, what sir has uh, said uh, it is like uh, sir has said given you a very very broad and uh, deep picture about the uh, department so being a forest officer no like the people will always have a dilemma uh, so because i'll uh, most of the prashant uh, actually sir said uh, initially uh, that uh, earlier the forest i mean people were uh, keeping forest as uh, option i mean option and uh, they were mainly focusing on civil services but nowadays uh, forest service is also getting its uh, uh, due um, recognition and uh, uh, talented people uh, like i think like uh, people are uh, keeping it as a main option only um, there is a lot of scope forest officers uh, uh, actually act as if you join police service it is your main uh, duty is just regulation you have to implement certain uh, rules and regulation with respect to law and order the or investigation or the protection to uh, some uh, vips like that uh, but being a forest officer uh, we also enforce some laws as sir mentioned whether it is indian forest act or state specific forest act or forest conservation act so that is one uh, regulatory role we have other than that uh, we have some quasi judicial powers also or uh, with respect to confiscation confiscation of uh, uh, property that that is being used or property or tool or any other thing that is uh, used in commission of uh, forest offence so that and uh, with respect to removal of uh, forest enclosements we have some we actually laws empower forest officers to enjoy some quasi judicial powers other than that uh, forest department i mean forest personnel also have some developmental uh, functions uh, uh, developmental functions mean uh, uh, is like uh, they implement a uh, lot of uh, schemes for example karnataka uh, aranya krishi aranya protsaha yojana uh, like that, to increase forest cover uh, outside the forest area it uh, gives forest i mean uh, farmers uh, seedlings and also it gives uh, uh, some incentives for, for uh, seedling being issued uh, so there are like greening of urban areas uh, uh, are like uh, for scheduled caste people or uh, tribal scheduled tribes uh, uh, like uh, giving of uh, cylinders or any other thing like that so some developmental functions also they uh, perform and some there are some uh, uh, facilitation of uh, services services means uh, we always look at what tangibly people get out of forest department that is less only intangibly there are uh, uh, n number of benefits that uh, come out of forest but uh, the recognition is little only so during covid some people just uh, thought that uh, what is the value of oxygen uh, like that uh, like that uh, more than oxygen i mean it is there but uh, water scarcity and uh, water related issues are going to become uh, Uh, serious uh, threats and challenges in india's uh, uh, future uh, so it, if the forests are managed well and there are uh, like uh, 
uh, if there is a little pressure on forest area obviously our uh, uh, watershed area watershed development will be good and uh, uh, streams uh, will flow with their uh, ecological flow as well as their purity is also there and one more thing you should always look up is uh, the water bodies related to uh, this wetland areas you should give your due attention to wetland areas and wherever you are coming from so because uh, as the <laughs> it was mentioned uh, this this lecture was mentioned just uh, yesterday only to me by shrinivas sir i could not prepare much about it and i could not prepare slides anyway i will give you my contact so if you are uh, uh, like if you have any queries related to uh, forest related issues you can just uh, uh, call me or uh, text me so maybe it will get resolved so this is what uh, I, this is what i wanted to say and uh, if you have any specific doubt uh, uh, this uh, session is open for the uh, uh, q and a thank you thank you sir thank you so much um, now the session is now open for questions um, we have some questions on the chat box already and uh, like ken moti sir said uh, you can unmute yourself also put your video on and you can ask your questions open especially preference to those who are uh, giving up uh, interviews personality test with the forest service exam or civil service exam still pending uh, we'll take the first two questions that have already come online uh, others can put your questions on chat box also you can please unmute yourself and ask the question Uh, so first question is in terms of uh, human animal conflict uh, dr moti sir uh, what innovative measures can be taken with respect to human animal conflict and you sir you can also take up the question sir uh, i i will share my bit mm, so so innovative measure means uh, the first uh, wherever animals are there wherever humans are there uh, we cannot uh, completely prevent the conflict because we cannot uh, simply just cut on off uh, the forest area and uh, uh, not letting the animal to venture out so that cannot happen uh, obviously there is a scope for mitigation uh, mitigation in the sense uh, for example i will tell the elephant uh, story with respect to uh, asan and madikeri uh, so now actually there is a growing uh, pressure on administration to uh, i mean like with 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 uh, honest uh, efforts uh, to mitigate that so one thing that uh, innovative what are innovative measure like for example if population is increasing earlier people were not uh, thinking of uh, sterilizing wild uh, animals so, but nowadays people are thinking about uh, sterilizing also uh, with respect to uh this thing uh, the elephant only that that uh, elephant is a migratory animal and uh, we have not uh, duly recognized that are uh, given uh, some uh, legal status so this uh, elephant corridors are uh, this uh, landscape planning of uh, elephant migratory paths uh, that is not the landscape planning also can be done and uh, this sterilization idea can be taken up wherever there is a problem has gone beyond our uh, uh, management uh, capacities uh, with respect to this uh, Uh, leopards uh, so people are actually now in the department uh, they are thinking of uh, uh, like ca capturing the uh, problematic animals and putting them in sort of a wide enclosed uh, safari area uh, where they can be um, it can be used for ecotourism purpose also uh, like that is there in the uh, gujarat devaliya in gir forest or in uh, madhya pradesh also it is there other than that uh, recently government has brought in elephant task force or leopard task force because uh, most of the times these wildlife issues are handled by regular territorial uh, uh, dfos or dcfs now there is a spe special task force and uh, it is being equipped with uh, uh, necessary logistics also and uh, manpower also uh, so that it can be uh, i mean like curbed well and one more thing uh, whenever uh, some msc happens uh, there is a dedicated team to respond to it one more thing uh, that uh, solacium or uh, compensation should be paid on time so governments have brought in uh, good uh, i mean good initiatives like for example in karnataka there is uh, something as e parihara also so like that uh, we can just introduce some measures sir uh, over to dr moti sir uh, innovative solutions yeah. for human yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 
Uh, see, there is uh, the I don't know. I, uh, maybe I was on mute. I was just trying to say something. See, this uh, man-animal conflict was a age-old problem. It's not a new thing. Only thing is the intensity has gone up. The animals are also as innovative as we are. So, if you are having a, a problem with an elephant, if you are trying to create some barricade, it will it will wait for some time. Then it will find out a way to overcome that uh, whatever uh, barrier you have created. So, uh, no solution is going to be a permanent solution for any of these animals. The only solution will be that you have to see what is the carrying capacity of an area and uh, limit the number of animals to the carrying capacity. That's the real solution. But unfortunately, for ethical or, uh, or many other reasons, we are not in a position to you know control these monkeys or, uh, or deer or whatever. For the time being, the governments are trying to find some solutions by way of you know creating more awareness among the people so uh, areas which are regularly prone for uh, these wildlife conflicts they create more awareness say that in panther areas if there is some panther running around uh, then uh, they announce in the villages that don't go after the sunset uh, then don't go alone and give some announcements and try to you know capture that animal all these things happen but there is a limit in all these things because the ultimately Animals will spill out of their protected areas. Because some of these animals are territorial, some of them are migratory. Uh, so the territorial animals will not allow another animal to come and you know occupy its area. So all those issues are there. Uh, things are happening, and the government is trying to you know put up some barricades. Like for example, in some places they dug elephant-proof trenches. That uh, has merits and that's it. demerits also. Similarly, they have tried uh, to putting up railway. Um, barrier uh, fences with uh, sleepers, railway sleepers, uh, railway girders. Railway girders were being erected as a barricade, and that also the animals uh, learn to navigate. So animals like the creeper, um, the crawler, or under that, or uh, you know, jump over that. All kinds of things are happening. There are no permanent solutions. One is one permanent solution is that uh, decide what is the carrying capacity, and uh, you have to remove some excess animals. But we, we may not be in a position to do it very soon until we reach a breaking point. Then we may have to cull out some animals. Many countries do this. For example, in Western uh, world, what they do is they have already killed all their carnivores. There is no control on the herbivores. So they gave licenses to people, uh, licenses are auctioned. You can go and shoot some deer. It may appear as a cruel practice, but that is the only way they are able to control. Like that, we may also have to do some sterilization measure, some capture. Uh, capture also, how many will capture? There are 3,200 panthers running around in Karnataka. But how many you can capture and put it in a zoo and each captured animal costs? So every day you have to feed it with some uh, 10 to 15 kg of meat and then take care of its partner in it. It will go sick. It will uh, all have babies. Then you need some more cages. So there is no end for this. It's like uh, human demands uh, that you meet some demands and new demands will come up. So at some point of time, we have to find uh, this carrying capacity. And uh, if we decide to dedicate more areas, that is fine. If we cannot dedicate more areas, then decide some ways of culling it. But all other measures will be in between. And then uh, government may sometimes appease people by giving more compensation. Now, latest government policy is that anybody who is killed in man-animal conflict will be given a job. And the compensation will also be more. The compensation was hiked to, I think, some earlier it used to be very marginal. I think now it is, uh, I don't know, Yogesh, do you, you remember what is the compensation? 10 lakhs? You're on mute. You're on mute. So there is some big compensation these days. 15 lakhs, sir. 15 lakhs for, for uh, human deaths. Yeah. They have revised. So three fundamental measures in Karnataka. One is creating awareness. Two, paying better compensation. And three, uh, those people uh, who have been killed, uh, they are kith and kin, get a job. So these are the three fundamental measures. But then animals uh, cannot be kept under control or their strain cannot be controlled. And their population also currently were not in a position to control. But some efforts are being done, but uh, I am not aware anywhere in the world whether the sterilization and all that has happened anywhere in the world. This is an ongoing problem. Yes, sir. So, yes. Uh, thank you, sir. There is another question in terms of challenges faced by deer force, especially in Naxal affected areas, and probably solutions for that. Oh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, 
Naxal affected areas are only mainly in the central Indian portion. Uh, and then forest officers are accused of uh, two things. One is that tribals are prevented from you know exercising their traditional rights of collecting forest produce and selling it freely. So that's one reason why the <coughs> tribals have rebelled and many others have joined. Then the second problem is they are not getting any employment, gainful employment uh, from the government schemes. So many schemes are not allowed to be implemented in forest areas. So that also is, for example, you want to put a current uh, electric line, not allowed. You want to dig something, not allowed. So there are several restrictions. Sir. So their employment is also a problem. Their uh, you know improving the livelihoods is also a problem. That has been solved to a great extent. The Luxal problem itself has been solved. Forest officers have to be sympathetic to the tribal needs. First of all, if they are sympathetic, actually the tribals, uh, both a lot of forest officers, they remember forest officers for decades. That so and so forest officer has helped us. So we have to recognize fundamentally the strong association between uh, the tribal community and the forests. And they should be allowed to you know, gather their produce for the livelihoods purpose. And then we should also create some employment opportunities for them, do some skill building and constructive activities which will improve their livelihoods. So final target is how do you improve the lives and livelihoods of tribal people? If we do that, there is no problem at all between uh, forest officers and the uh, Mm, and there are a lot of schemes also from the tribal welfare ministry also. So, so long it is being done, there is not, not much a problem. Uh, but when forest are, some of them are suburbly you know, conservative and they don't allow anybody to enter forest or collect any produce, then it creates a problem. This is a kind of more related, this problem is related more to the flexible attitude and a concern uh, about tribals as much as we are concerned about the trees or you know animals. So the same amount of concern has to be shown to tribals, then there will not be any problem. But anyway, these days it is substantially mitigated. There is not much problem. Uh, but anybody getting selected or anybody going to be working in the central Indian portions, they have to be sympathetic to tribals. There is no other way. Right, sir. Um, can you brief on your opinion about recent amendments into the forest conservation rules? Yogi, sir, you want to take it? Actually, I have not dwelt too much into reels. I am yet to go through them. I mean, wildlife area. Uh, but anyway, definitely, uh, the intention of uh, new rules is to just uh, delegate more powers to regionally empowered committees and uh, just to decide on the FC matter uh, in time bound manner. And uh, they have uh, created uh, two committees one is screening committee and advisory committee. So it, it is with some people argue that uh, they have just diluted the stringent rules. Uh, and uh, some other uh, people argue that uh, uh, it is the need of the hour because uh, proposals uh, uh, just uh, kept on pending for our years together. So in my case, uh, uh, setting time bound, uh, uh, I mean, like uh, setting timeline for deciding on the topic is a good thing, but uh, it should not be hurried up. Like uh, it, they have to sit. It is a genuine problem also because we have heard uh, within the department itself. Uh, so just uh, department show doesn't, I mean, doesn't show interest because anyway, we are losing some patch of forest land. Uh, but uh, in, in, personally, I feel uh, for uh, it, it is brought with uh, some uh, thing in mind uh, just to, to keep it one uh, like uh, kind of uh, people, our forest people will also be very, uh, very much uh, in tune with the happenings around us. It is. Personally, I feel it is positive, uh, but uh, people may have, may have a different perception about it. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a question about difference between DFO wildlife and DFO social forestry. And uh, in that case, Muthi, sir, if you can help us understand the hierarchy and the differences of the job profiles. The fire department has basically some three, four. Uh, Broad uh, you know, positions at the ground level, district level. Uh, the wildlife is one DFO who looks after all the wild animals, particularly protected, those in, which are in protected areas. So you will have a few sanctuaries to manage or one tiger reserve or some uh, big wildlife area. A uh, social forest man works uh, mostly in the rural areas along with the rural development and panchayat department. Their job is to create you know, greenery, plant as many trees as possible on the farmlands. So that is his job. So his job is outside the forest. He is no way connected with the forest. Uh, his job is to you know raise as many seedlings 
is a development man, he is a development phase. Uh, the territorial forest officer is another officer who is in charge of a, a group of forest areas. And his job is to manage those forest areas somewhere he may have to cut and somewhere he may have to, he may have to plant. So his job is managing those resources. The conservation part is taken care of by the wildlife officer. The development portion is uh, taken care of by the, um, the development portion is taken care of by the social forestry. So these are three bottom positions. There are also many other positions. There are many other positions. Some research positions are there. Some planning positions are there. Uh, there are uh, other special positions like uh, surveys and demarcation. Uh, there are lots of positions, but these are uh, uh, those are only kind of uh, internal positions. They don't have much public interface. Uh, public interface. The interface is available only for three officers: the territorial officer, because there are a lot of people living in and around forest areas, and the uh, wildlife officer. So he is managing the forest, wild animals and a lot of visitors in, coming into the forest and a lot of animals going out of the forest. Uh, whereas the territory the social forest officer is concerned with the uh, uh, farmer and their interests in you know raising trees and marketing them and find out uh, trees, uh, tree growing tree growing as an alternative income source the government of india is planning to you know double the farmers income by some 2030 some 2025 some figure is there but uh, uh, this is this is one because it gives a lump sum income tree growing now a lot of farmers are cultivating very fast growing species like uh, some milia dubia uh, all industries have ad adopted advanced technologies. Earlier, we used to look for some teak only, that to mature teak, 100 years old, 200 years old. Now, you don't need any of that. A young plant goes through a lot of technology and they can give you a door or a door frame or a window frame or furniture or a load bearing element, which is as strong as two years old teak. It comes from very young, young crop. So, technology is developing. And that will, you know, reduce the burden of the territorial forest areas or forest products coming from the forest areas. But then the pressure on the natural forest for supply of medicinal plants is increasing. That's one area of concern that uh, with the COVID, uh, everybody is shifting to herbal medicines. And there are something like some 2,000 odd plants which are in regular consumption. And only some 20, 30 are cultivated. A large part of them are collected from the wild areas. And the wild areas include forest areas. So, uh, the broad positions are uh, with having a public interface are only these three territorial forest officer, wildlife officer, uh, the social forest officer. There are many other positions who are working in the background. Training is there, research is there, extension is there, a uh, lot of other positions, surveys uh, there, a lot many are there. Great, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, one question about uh, eco sensitive zones and tribal rights. Uh, Soumya sir has addressed in his initial address, so we will be able to access that answer there. Uh, Mithun has a question in terms of increasing forest fires in India and across the world. Uh, what would be the possible solutions to reduce the incidence and mitigate about forest fires? Forest fires increasing across the India and world. How to reduce incidence? One is the second one is apprehensions on eco sensitive zones. Uh, whether it is detrimental tribal rights, especially in Western Australia. Okay. Okay, should you like to answer? Yes, sir. Uh, we, so, forest fires are also like uh, surset, no? Uh, like uh, wildlife issues, uh, wildlife conflicts are uh, very normal. Like that, uh, nature has developed its own mechanism to keep certain, uh, certain things in check. Mm -hmm. So, only uh, uncontrolled fire becomes a problem. So these days, uh, the incidence of uncalled, uncontrolled forest uh, uh, fires is increasing, especially in the drier parts of uh, uh, areas, uh, be it uh, in the Deccan area or, uh, uh, like, uh, or some parts of uh, Himalaya, like in Himachal Pradesh. Or uh, last few two years back, uh, there was a there were a lot of fire incidents in uh, um, northeastern and. Uh, that Australia, Australia, when the global scenario, Australian bushfire was a well-known example. So the question is, uh, how to? Once again, uh, so they are increasing in the world because you know, right? Uh, like uh, there is a because of climate change, there is an onset of uh, this seasons is also increasing, and their duration is also like there are variations. So and uh, annual mean temperature also increasing. So it, but generally. Uh, most of the forest fires uh, are, have, I mean, like caused by uh, uh, human beings only, due to various reasons. Uh, so, uh, 
so most of the times the forest fires which happen because of natural reasons they can be avoided uh, like uh, by covering the invasive species like that happens in uh, 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 like for example in bandipur or nagarwale area like lantana is there or eupatorium is there like that and the uh, department also initiates so, so many measures uh, like uh, maintenance of fire lines uh, and uh, keeping uh, like just in, uh, empowering the forest department with all the logistics that is being uh, uh, deployed to like uh, give a swift and timely response to forest fires uh, uh, like blowers or uh, any other uh, type of material and uh, taking the support of uh, people staying in the fringe areas uh, these are the general uh, measures that are uh, utilized to control the forest fires uh, other than that uh, yesterday i told you like uh, recent initiatives people are uh, looking for uh, going for uh, some technology initiatives like the using thermal drones to uh, map which are the areas that are very highly prone to forest fires sir. and uh, you know uh, there are many sa satellite based uh, te satellite technology based uh, interventions like fire alerts so karnataka also uh, has karnataka state remote sensing application center also has uh, like very precise uh, that gives location one is with respect to mitigation mitigation means uh, uh, like just to uh, uh, like uh, reduce the incidence uh, of forest fires after that we have to give a swift response so this is the only thing and uh, always uh, like we have to patrol uh, increase the patrolling and uh, avoid the uh, uh, man made uh, forest fires other than the and the invasive keeping invasive species in check and uh, incentivizing the people where there was a zero forest uh, fire forest fire incidents that happens in maharashtra like that only uh, we have to reduce the forest fires uh, sir murthy sir uh, if you want to add uh, points please sir okay so these forest fires uh, are invariably they are uh, man made there are, there are very little you know kind of uh, uh, natural fires are very few i mean invariably made by human beings and human beings have lots of intentions so somebody you know uh, out of grudge ship may put fire somebody may go for collection of honey may put fire and somebody uh, we do something called fire tracing fire escapes and it turns into forest and it becomes a big fire some people want to you know their hills they have a feeling that the atmosphere becomes warm they get early rains all kind of things are it's a complex issue but then education is happening and it is coming down uh the, 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 the most important thing is the moment detection of fire timely detection and a timely attendance to the fire can keep it controlled now uh, department is um, very well geared and they have lot of fire camps everywhere people watching fire whenever there is a smoke uh, nearby camps some roads are ready some vehicles are ready mobiles are ready a um, lot of uh, you know water also sometimes helicopters are being deployed that was rare in india Yeah, sometimes helicopters are also being being deployed to carry water, but they are all secondary. First thing is early detection and deploying people all over the place, and then uh, reaching out to uh, the fire fire spot very early. That that uh, reduces the fire. Basically, because these are all caused by human beings uh, handling the human beings in those areas. Uh, because a lot of the forest, um, uh, the the forest is created. Uh, the, the 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 forest fires are created by local people only supposing they are handled uh, uh, badly the fellow will be waiting for summer and they will they will tell you also that i will i'll see how the say the forest is summer so these kinds of things are there it is a slow process but uh, the department is uh, geared much better they have fire blowers uh, they have fire extinguishers uh, people are carrying on their back backpacks are there uh, lots of things are there it will be controlled But the only thing is the uh, complete protection from forest also, uh, forest fire also no, not a good idea. Ground fires are always welcome; it has some positive role in the ecology. But uh, huge fires, particularly the ground fires, eliminate forest. It has happened uh, historically also; it is not new. A uh, lot of forests have been wiped out, and new forests have been created. All those things have happened. But then uh, man-made fires are not a good thing, and as far as possible, if you control it, it's happening. But some once in a while, it go, it will go out of hand. but there is nothing to worry about now that
couple of other questions i can see here uh, one is on uh, exotics exotics uh, is a uh, you know these exotics have come up for some reason because they are easy to cultivate crop they give you high productivity and all that and exotics have also served many purposes now today you are naming two species one is this acacia acacia is now second to teak in terms of quality in terms of pricing also is very good and uh, it is giving you a lot of paper earlier casuarina uh, eucalyptus used to be there and casuarina casuarina also very similarly high color if you use they are used to be used Really for centering pillars and centering centering posts and also for mining purpose, a huge quantity of casuarina was used. We have done this out of our requirement need need when you need huge quantity of wood and very fast and uh, you know assured quality. Uh, today also eucalyptus is a big controversy, uh, but people are not they want to ban it. Banning is easy, but there are uh, no alternatives now. We should look at how many books our children need every year. how many million children are uh, reading uh, in this uh, country how many offices are working how much of paper is consumed for textbook notebooks and uh, uh, most of the paper is coming from eucalyptus most of the paper is coming from eucalyptus banning is easy but where is the substitute can you can we uh, have our school education or college education to, without books if we are heading in the direction but then uh, you cannot do away with books completely digital gadgets are fine but they have a certain limit and there are certain adverse effects also so books cannot be completely given away so for that reason we need to have this uh, uh, exotics because they give you very fast productivity and they can meet uh, specific requirements like acacia is now being used as a good timber casuarina of course it has come down the eucalyptus is mainly for the pulp and paper the paper use is again going up because now we don't want the plastic covers we want paper covers and we also want a huge amount of cartons amazon sends you order a small uh, small article but you will pack it in such a huge quantity of packaging material that's all paper based so pulp is required for all of that uh, so long our river, you know human requirements remain very huge we can't give away these things uh, we also have some good species but i feel we have not experimented sufficiently because somebody has told you that acacia is very fast growing somebody has given a seed So we have done it very fast, but many, many, many species are there. Uh, Indian domestic species also, which uh, which can be equally fast, which is equally good. But that kind of research we have not done internally. Therefore, we are depending on these exotics. But a day may come when we have more species to offer to the world, and that day may not be very far off. So we also have equally good species, but only thing is we haven't done enough research to you know say that I have this species now. Melia dubia, for example, is one species. It's grabbing a lot of land. It's producing a lot of wood. and plywood most of the plywood is coming out of milia dubia so that's the domestic species and that research has happened only in the last 20 years so had we done sufficient research we would have discovered our own species we haven't done enough research therefore we are depending on outside but in due course probably this will come down then what kind of diseases can be transferred from domestic animals to wild animals domestic animals to wild animals there is a very common thing is foot and mouth disease and this comes uh, on a cyclical basis once in 20 years it will come in Uh, the domestic cattle uh, affected go into forest for grazing, and uh, when the saliva gets distributed, and sometimes the foot and mouth disease also spreads from the hooves of the animals. Uh, the, some 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 areas have so many leeches; they bite different different animals. Kind of diseases. So, foot and mouth is the most dreaded disease, which is spreading from domestic animals to wild animals. Antra is also true. Uh, sometimes the wild animals also transmit some diseases to human beings, and the Karnataka is famous for. Uh, some disease called kyasanur forest disease it is distribute you know it is um, you know you know spread from monkeys to human beings and there is a, there are very few vaccines and it's a very severe thing it is popular in a very commonly found in chikkamagalur and shimoga districts it's called kfd kyasanur forest disease so candidates should have some knowledge some basic knowledge this is spreading from and the latest is covid covid they say it has spread from bats to humans so both ways it is possible from animals to uh, you know uh, from domestic animals to uh, the wild animals from uh, wild animals to domestic animals and wild animals to you know human beings so if you look at the old uh, aids also is supposed to some disease from some chipa somewhere so some of these chronic things they ultimately traced it to some wild wild animals it has come from wild animals 
both ways it is possible but uh, the transmission from domestic animals to uh, wild animals is highly localized and uh, it can be detected very quickly and then it can be cordoned up you know we had a couple of uh, times these kind of incidents somewhere in badra and entire uh, population of uh, ba go uh, gaur Gau, indian gaur indian bison was wiped out it is still not fully restored uh, sometimes it also happened in uh, bandipur and uh, uh, nagarhole areas but there there was a control but badra is one place where complete wipe out of indian gaur was there and uh, it is still recovering so, so, so it affects the deer and it also affects the uh, particularly the grass eaters uh, so those animals get very badly affected so these are the commonly known things there may be few minor things but they are not on the epidemic scale they may be localized the epidemics are only foot and mouth and this casnur also is very localized uh, every year some few people die eight people ten people die uh, human beings but otherwise it's not a great threat thank you okay. sir very nice for the entire session it's been very enriching and especially for young aspiring bureaucrats uh, and as we initially started passionate uh, forest service uh, aspirants that we see um, such sessions will definitely be a lot more eye opener as they think forward thank you so much to muti sir specifically for making time out of his schedule and continuing to be along with us to regularly encourage and thank you so much uh, mr ubish for being part of the session in spite of the work schedule that the part of so hoping to see you both in the academy very soon in fact in the students face to face and also uh exams coming up interviews coming up so wishing all of you all the very best thank you now uh, once again to the guests thank you to all the participants for being present till the end of the session thank you sir thank you so much okay thank, thank you. you all i hope i we have given a glimpse of uh, the first three if there are more questions you are always welcome thank you so much sir thank you so much for all the time and the value and the enrichment that we have seen through thank you so much thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day to all of you. All the very best in all the endeavors that you're taking forward. India Forest Team and management wishes you all the very best as you take things ahead. Good day.